Now, Money in the Bank is next Saturday, and it's going to be airing from the O2 in London. So we're going to have a hot crowd in Toronto for Forbidden Door tonight. We should have an equally hot crowd in the UK next Saturday. It's a 3 o'clock Eastern start uh, because they are overseas. So here on the East Coast, it's a 3 p.m. pay-per-view start time. There are a couple of matches that could be added to the show this week. I'm going to go through the card and give my predictions now. But I fully expect that there might be at least one more match added to the show. Gunther defending the Intercontinental Championship against Matt Riddle, I think, would be the most likely one. And if that happens, I think the two of them are going to have a a great match, but Gunther is going to retain. Rhea Ripley against Natalya for the uh, Women's Championship, the World Heavyweight title, could also be added. Don't ask me why Natalya would have another title match when she was squashed the first time. She got destroyed before the bell even rang on Monday. But it could be a case where she winds up getting another title match. If so, the outcome is not going to be any different than it was at Night of Champions. Rhea Ripley will go over. But these are the matches that we do know. And I want to start off with the men's Money in the Bank match. Because there's a lot to discuss when it comes to this match. Money in the Bank this year has Logan Paul, LA Knight, Butch, Santos Escobar, Shinsuke Nakamura, Damian Priest, and Ricochet. After weeks of qualifying matches on television, Logan Paul just showed up on Monday night in Cleveland and he was gifted a spot in the Money in the Bank match. It went from six to seven because of who he is. He said as much on Monday Night Raw. He said he is single-handedly going to put respect back on the Cleveland name. Logan Paul became the odds-on favorite to win the moment his name got added to this match. And it also adds some star power to a match that could really use some. And after their big spot at the Royal Rumble this year, I'm sure him and Ricochet have something big planned. My heart tells me LA Knight. You've heard me say it ad nauseum now for weeks. I think LA Knight should win. I'd like to see LA Knight win. It would be huge for his career, potentially. Of course, the key is in the follow-up. If he wins money in the bank and then loses in embarrassing fashion on the cash-in, like Baron Corbin did years ago... (laughs) then it's not going to be so good for him. But my heart tells me L.A. Knight. My head tells me Logan Paul. Because it's exactly the sort of thing that WWE would do. But my prediction is Damian Priest wins the Money in the Bank briefcase. Last year, Austin Theory won the briefcase. He cashed in on Seth Rollins for a shot at the United States Championship. So the precedent has already been set that the winner does not have to cash in for a world title match. Priest wins, and I could see him eventually cashing in for a match with Gunther in a few months. Once Gunther has broken the all-time record, and we're not that far from it, you know, the beginning of September, once that's happened, it's fair game as far as when he loses the championship and to whom. And I think Damian Priest could be that person. He could be the one with or without money in the bank. Even if I'm wrong and he doesn't win the briefcase... I still feel like he is the likeliest option to take that Intercontinental title from Gunther. The question is, if he wins Money in the Bank and eventually cashes in for an IC title match, would they want back-to-back winners on back-to-back years cashing in for a secondary title? You know, that I don't know. But the bigger reason for him to win Money in the Bank is the potential that it creates for drama within the Judgment Day. If Priest wins, let's say, and Balor loses his match with Seth Rollins, Even more so if Dominic Mysterio can somehow beat Cody. And Balor ends up the sole member of the Judgment Day to lose on this show. He wouldn't be very happy about that. And it also creates drama if Priest wins and then you have Balor challenging for the world title. Might Priest tease a cash-in? You know, I know he already told Finn Balor that he wouldn't. But what he says and what he does may be two entirely different things. Logan Paul winning would allow him to carry the briefcase around with him wherever he goes. Or he could cash in that same night. He could win the briefcase early in the show and then go on to win the title, not from Roman Reigns, but from Seth Rollins, the man who beat him at WrestleMania. LA Knight could win and he could cash in on either top champion, but Roman Reigns would be a suicide mission. So Seth Rollins would make more sense and that would then move LA Knight over to the Raw brand. Speaking of L.A. Knight, he told the Daily Mail 
this week that WWE transitioned him into a manager's role as Max Dupree due to concerns over his age. He said, I come up for a dark match. I get the attention of the right people. Hey, who is this guy? But then the age thing comes up. Whispers. Oh no, he's 40. Danger. But I'm not the average 40-year-old. I haven't gone through the ringer. I haven't had a bunch of surgeries or injuries. Knock on that wood. I've lived a good, youthful life in a certain sense, and I've taken care of myself in a way that I would say most don't. And also, I look a certain way where obviously I got somebody's attention. But that number came up, and it was like, well, okay, we'll make him a manager. So some things happened there. It was not my cup of tea, and definitely I don't think it was for me. But somehow there I was. Some things happened that we don't need to get into, and that eventually LA Knight was back. Yes, some things happened last year that we don't need to get into. But thank God they did happen when they did. Otherwise, we wouldn't have LA Knight right now. LA Knight would never have even gotten a chance on the main roster as himself. 40 is the new 30. I don't just say that because I'm I'm basically in the same boat, but 40 is the is the new 30. 40 years old in WWE today is very different than 40 years old in WWE 30 or 40 years ago. When those guys were working close to 300 days a year, taking bumps on those hard rings. A lot of their top talents are either in their 40s or they're in their late 30s. That should not disqualify somebody from being considered for a top spot. I understand wanting to get younger and wanting to build up some youthful talent that you can build around for the next 10 or 15 years. You can do that. Nobody is saying you can't do that. Nobody is saying you can't look at a Braun Breaker or a Carmelo Hayes and call them up and really start building around them in these next couple of years. But if they have the tools to be a top star and the fans seem to like them and they're getting behind them, those people should be given the opportunity to sink or swim on their own. And not because the emperor in the weeds has set some arbitrary number as a guideline for who can and cannot be considered a main event player. So those are the three serious options for Money in the Bank this year. Logan Paul, L.A. Knight, and Damian Priest. I worry that they're going to just give it to Logan Paul. I want to see L.A. Knight win it. But I've also come around to the idea of Damian Priest actually winning the briefcase. And I think that's the one that makes the most storyline sense, to be honest with you. Logan Paul is a part-time player. Damian Priest is somebody the company clearly thinks highly of, considering some of the spots they've put him in in recent months. And by the way, Damian Priest is two months older than L.A. Knight. Nakamura is in this match. Nakamura could be a dark horse. That doesn't really excite me. Escobar, Butch, Ricochet, any of those three would surprise me. Ricochet has no shot. The other two, it's not impossible. Butch I could see as another dark horse. I actually, I see Butch being a likelier dark horse than even Nakamura. Yeah, with him cashing in maybe on the U.S. title in Austin Theory, who has been a complete non-entity since his win over John Cena at WrestleMania. They wasted a John Cena WrestleMania match this year on this fucking guy. But Sheamus gave an interview to the Metro this past week. He was very vocal about his frustrations with WWE Creative. and get in line. But very vocal about his frustrations with WWE Creative. He feels they really dropped the ball on doing more with the, the brawling brutes and more specifically with Ridge Holland and with Butch. Butch, I would agree with. And him winning money in the bank would be one way to try to fix that. But I think Damian Priest gets the briefcase. We have Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler defending their newly unified women's tag team titles against Raquel Rodriguez and the returning Liv Morgan. On SmackDown Friday night, Ronda and Shayna, they beat Alba Fire and Isla Dawn to unify the WWE and NXT women's tag team titles into one. But now we are back to having one set of women's tag team titles that can be defended on all three brands, which is the way that it always should have been. You could defend them on Raw, you could defend them on SmackDown, you could even defend them in NXT. And given how the ratings have gone in putting some of the main roster talents, namely Seth Rollins, on the show last week, I don't think we're going to have to wait very long. We're going to be getting Ronda Rousey on Tuesdays. But given that they just unified the titles, and it's Ronda, I don't see this company taking the titles off of her uh, this quickly. 
Liv Morgan is back. That's good to see for her. I thought she was going to be out for longer, but she showed up as a surprise on Friday. Uh, I don't see things going well for them, though, on Saturday. So Ronda and Shayna are my pick to retain. We have Cody Rhodes one-on-one with Dominic Mysterio. This really has... I mean, th- there's no Earth that exists in the solar system where Dominic Mysterio should be beating Cody Rhodes. But I think that's exactly what's going to happen on Saturday, and I think he will owe it all to Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar and Cody Rhodes are going to be wrestling at SummerSlam. We know this. It's common sense. They're building to a third match between them with some sort of stipulation. Now, Brock Lesnar could come out after the match. Brock Lesnar could come out and attack Cody on Raw the following Monday. All of that is true. But Cody has been talking a lot of smack about Brock now for weeks, calling him a coward and calling him all sorts of names. I see this as Brock Lesnar trying to get back at Cody by costing him, not only costing him a win, but a very embarrassing loss. Because for him to lose to Dominic, there could be nothing more embarrassing. Maybe losing to Baron Corbin. But next to losing to Baron Corbin, there could be nothing more embarrassing for Cody than losing to Dom Dom. And I think for Dominic, once he gets this win over Cody, we're never going to hear the end of it. This is going to be this is going to be like his greatest achievement. We'll hear about this for months. The man who beat Cody Rhodes. And even if Cody eventually wins the championship, I'm the man who beat Cody Rhodes. I should be owed a championship, Matt. Like Dominic could parlay this into so much in his in his promos. But also go back to what I said earlier, you know, with the Judgment Day story. If all the members of the Judgment Day that have matches at Money in the Bank win their matches except for Finn Balor, it just feeds into that whole story and it feeds into his anger and his jealousy towards Damian Priest. Dominic would have to win. That's the only way Dominic wins. If Brock Lesnar gets involved and he costs Cody Rhodes the match. And that's my prediction. I am picking Dominic to beat Cody. This is where we are. Think of where we were a few months ago where Cody Rhodes was in the WrestleMania main event against Roman Reigns. And then he lost. And now here we are heading into Money in the Bank and I am sitting here predicting that Cody will lose to Dominic Mysterio. This is where we are. We have the women's Money in the Bank ladder match with Bayley, Io Sky, Becky Lynch, Trish Stratus, Zoe Stark, and Zelina Vega. Trish had her first singles match on Raw in 12 years on Monday night against Raquel Becky Lynch inadvertently cost Raquel the match and gave Trish the win. So Trish is in Money in the Bank. The only outcome here that this match should have is Io Sky standing on the ladder holding up the women's briefcase. I am picking Io Sky to win the women's Money in the Bank. Bailey could steal the win from her. It is it is very possible that Bailey could win. In fact, if Io doesn't win, Bailey would be my next choice. But I'm going with Io. You saw the reaction she got at Backlash. I know that was a special crowd in Puerto Rico. But clearly, Io is on her way out of this whole damage control thing. And her winning money in the bank and Bailey losing would only, I think, exacerbate the situation and make it worse. And you could do Io cashing in, you know, not not unannounced, but cashing in in advance for a match with Asuka at SummerSlam. You keep the whole Charlotte Bianca Belair situation separate. Now we have to wait and see, of course, what happens on SmackDown this Friday because Charlotte is wrestling Asuka for the championship. And it's Charlotte Flair. So nobody could ever discount the possibility that Charlotte Flair will walk out of there with the title. That would be number 15 if she does. I don't think she will. I think Asuka's title is safe on Friday. But again, you don't need to have a title on the line with Charlotte and Bianca. You could do a triple threat at SummerSlam with Charlotte, Bianca, and Asuka. You could do that. Maybe they will. But you don't have to. You can get two matches out of it. You let Charlotte and Bianca, especially if Bianca has some role in Charlotte losing or not winning on Friday, and they go off and do their thing, and you can have Asuka defend the title against EO Sky. You get two big women's matches out of it at SummerSlam instead of one. You still have one more match you could throw in there from the Raw side with Rhea Ripley. We have Seth Rollins defending his World Heavyweight Championship against Finn Balor. Seth Rollins is my pick. He's going to retain his World Heavyweight title. How 
things unfold when the match is over depends a lot, I think, on who wins the Money in the Bank match. If I'm wrong about Damian Priest and Logan Paul ends up winning Money in the Bank, there is the distinct possibility that Logan Paul comes back out after Rollins wins. Balor is furious. Balor puts him down, double stops the shit out of this guy. And here comes Logan Paul to pick the bones and cash in. And Logan Paul could leave London with the World Heavyweight Championship. It is a very distinct possibility. He's obviously a part-time player, but you give him a short-term run, and Rollins wins the belt right back from him at SummerSlam. In the meantime, it gets them some, some media attention, which we all know they love and crave. There's also the possibility that Drew McIntyre can make his return at Money in the Bank. Drew McIntyre has been gone since WrestleMania. The rumors have been that WWE really wants him back in the mix creatively by Money in the Bank when they make that trip over to London. And I think when Drew comes back, and he will be back, he'll be... I don't know what he'll be. I think he should be a heel. I don't know if they'll do it or not. But I think Drew coming back as a heel and making Seth Rollins his target also makes a lot of sense, and it would give Seth a new opponent at SummerSlam, instead of either doing a Balor rematch or a Logan Paul rematch, Rollins and McIntyre would be a fresh match that we haven't seen. At least not for a long time. I'm, I can't remember the last time those two had a match. It's been a while. So I, I put all of these ideas out there because WWE has a lot of options here. There are a lot of viable options for how these things can go, but Rollins losing to Balor is not one of them. I just can't see that happening. So Rollins is going to uh, retain his championship. And then we have the Bloodline Civil War. Roman Reigns and Solo Sokoa taking on the Usos. It was at Money in the Bank 10 years ago that Roman Reigns and the Usos found themselves on opposite sides of the ring. I was at that show. I was at the Wells Fargo Center in Philadelphia. It was the Shield against the Usos on the kickoff show. And it was almost as if, boy, you know, they left us off the main card. Let's go out there and show everybody how it's done. And they went out there, and considering they didn't make the main card, they had a main card-worthy match. They had a hell of a match together, uh, did the Shield and the Usos that night. So here we are now, a decade later, and Roman Reigns and the Usos find themselves once again uh, waging war against each other. This will be only the second time that Roman and Solo were paired up as a team, and they lost their first match at Night of Champions to Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. I don't see them losing a second time. I'm going to pick Roman Reigns and Solo Sokoa. I feel like they're walking out with the win. I think they could certainly tease tension here. Maybe a blown spot. Something happens. Tension between Roman and Solo. I don't think this is the night that they pull the trigger on Solo. Giving Roman the Samoan spike. Or walking away from Roman. I feel like that's something they would say for SummerSlam. Because I still think, even if Roman and Solo win this match and the Usos fall, I still think the championship match for SummerSlam that they do is Roman Reigns against Jey Uso. Not Solo, not Jimmy, probably not some sort of bloodline four-way. I think it's Roman against Jey, and I could see that being the moment that Roman loses Solo. So I don't see that happening in Money in the Bank, but I do see Roman and Solo picking up the win Obviously, this storyline is still the best thing going creatively in this company. How much more can they milk it and juice it? How much longer can they extend it for? Uh, I don't know. For their sake, I hope they can do it for a long time because I look at SmackDown. The way SmackDown's been lately, you take out the Bloodline stuff, that show has fucking nothing. Nothing. So they lose the Bloodline stuff or somebody roaming, God forbid, something. Go someone goes down to injury, something happens, they're fucked on Friday nights. And they're going to be forced to come up with something compelling to keep people tuned into that show. Because right now, there ain't nothing compelling on that show outside of the Bloodline stuff. You go back and watch that show on Friday and tell me that was a really interesting, exciting show. Give me a break. Thank God for the Bloodline stuff on that show. 